So right. yeah, so we're we're going to follow that up. Uh, Eric Colombo is going to talk about evaluation of surgical residents, looking at non-operative surgical skills, um, the assessment of workforce for surgeons after completion of their training, and transferring of skills from a training model to an independent practice model. Eric, thank you, Jim. Yep, thanks. So uh, is uh, Arun said, I'm really going to focus on the other stuff, the stuff that kind of happens outside the uh, the operating room, and, and hopefully convince you that that stuff's really important. So these are my disclosures. Uh, anybody here actually been involved in writing a textbook? Yeah, was that really a useful retirement strategy for you? <laughs> yeah, not so much for me. So, uh, And then I serve in these two boards. So here's my outline. I'm going to talk a little bit of history here, kind of uh, picking up a little bit where John is like, so why do we even have these competencies? What were the drivers behind that? A little bit about the role of a competency-based model. And then, like I said, I'll talk about why the other stuff matters and, and kind of look at it through an assessment lens. So um, as we think about the rise of the competencies, I think it's always uh, important to go back. I, uh, let me just say right up front, I love my training. Um, very much enjoyed medical school and love my residency. But I do worry that sometimes we engage in what I call nostalgialitis imperfecta profunda. Um, that we think things were so great in the past. The reality is they really weren't. Uh, how many people remember this book, House of God? Yeah. Um, not exactly a wonderful reflection of the profession, if you might say. Um, I made the mistake of giving this book to my mother at the time, who was completely horrified. Um, I'm like, wow, this is amazing, this is what I'm going into. And she's just like, what, are you kidding me? Um, how many people uh, were aware this was actually turned into a movie? Yeah, why wasn't it released to the general public? It was actually, uh, there was a public screening done in Boston um, where they often do that before they release it, and the response was so negative that it was never put out for wide distribution. You can get it on Netflix, by the way. Um, and the star of that was actually Tim Matheson, who'd just come off his Animal House fame. Um, this was one of his next movies. But the public was just so horrified by the movie, the, the stuff that was going on, that they just never released it for wide distribution. How many people were this book? Interesting. So this is a really important book from 1984 by Jay Katz, who really talked about the really significant dysfunction in doctor-patient communication. That you know we were really still in a paternalistic uh, kind of posture with patients, that we weren't connecting, um, that patients were feeling very much isolated in their conversations with patients. And so this book actually had quite an effect. And if you go back and look at some of the studies around communication, then they're pretty sobering. Uh, one was a famous study by Harold Beckman, who looked at the amount of time a physician gave a patient before they interrupted them. Anybody know how many seconds that was? Yeah, it was actually 18 in the study. That was it. They gave patients 18 seconds and then they interrupted. Okay? So it goes to show you that there's some real challenges. And, and then the, the one that um, you may be aware of is Shep Newland, who was a surgeon at Yale and the Haven. And I was a resident at the time when he was there. And, he wrote this book that um, received a lot of attention, and in that he talked about talking patients into doing stuff that he knew would not help them, particularly some of his oncology patients, and he really felt a lot of guilt around that. A ship uh, died in, in 2002, but this book actually quite had an impact. Around the same time, things began to happen within the profession. Uh, in Canada, there was actually a doctor strike in the province of Ontario. And that led to a series of conversations of, of the profession with the public about what the public expected of those uh, physicians. And then in our country, John alluded to this, the air is human around looking at the patient safety um, data and then crossing the quality chasm. And it was you know, the air is human that really triggered quite a reaction because it estimated that somewhere between 40, 49,000 patients were dying each year from medical error. Anybody know what they based that number on and when that study was actually conducted? So it was actually the Harvard Medical Practice Study, and that data was collected in the state of New York, my senior year of medical school in 1985, right? So there were signals, but the problem is we didn't really have good measurement. That was part of our challenge. We just honestly often didn't know. But in this context is really why there became an interest to rethink training because of these kind of other important gaps that were beginning to be recognized. And so um, this is a, an interesting article from Jay Crossan who at the time was at Kaiser, and he surveyed all the department chairs within the Kaiser system about what they, what they were seeing as gaps coming into their disciplines, including you know, all the surgical disciplines. 
a lot of issues around office-based practice competencies, interprofessional team skills, not working on teams, not knowing how to use information technology, how to manage a population. You know, when you got a population of patients or, or some uh, population you're responsible for. Um, lack of reflective practice skills and also being able to engage in ongoing continuous quality improvement, care coordination, continuity issues, leadership and management skills, systems thinking, not understanding how to work with the system. And then as you know, John talked about, the even concerns around procedural skills. And so this was kind of very much in line with concerns that had been raised in some of these earlier reports. And then more recently, I think we've had kind of three really important um, things that we need to be attending to. This came out in July 2014 from the Institute of Medicine, and it really talked about the governance and financing of GE and, and the problems with it. And although this report hasn't yet gone anywhere, it has been a receptor site for a lot of policymakers in DC. Um, there was a questioning of whether or not public funds should be used at all. The conclusion of the report was that for at least the time being, at least the next decade, the answer is we should continue because of be too disruptive, but we should think about how those funds flow including the creation of an innovation fund of 10% of the total uh, Medicare spend that should flow directly into education. Um, I'm not a statistician uh, or psychometrician like Stan, but I'm pretty sure 10% of 10 billion is, I think, a billion dollars. And I'm pretty sure educators could figure out a way to use that um, pretty effectively. But that sits out there. This is another one I think that when we think about the other stuff, it's not just about what happens in the operating rooms, but happens before. This is a report that was released last September. How many people had a chance to read this? Anybody? I would strongly encourage you to read the executive summary in the first chapter. If you read those two things, that would be enough. But what they basically said that you know, diagnostic errors has become a serious patient safety issue for the system. And you can see the figures up there. They're pretty sobering. In fact, every American can expect to experience at least one diagnostic error in the lifetime in the healthcare system, at least one. The good news is many of them don't lead to severe morbidity and mortality, but many still do. And you can see that even with all of our technology today, when there's studies looking at the using autopsies and post-mortem examinations, we're still missing roughly 10% of the diagnoses during the hospital care. And, and so this is something that I think we need to attend to. This is still really important. Data has shown for decades, by the way, that the history of physical still matters in what we do, which is, I think should be good news for us. Um, but yet, it's something that's also slid because of the lack of, of good teaching. This is the most recent thing, and I think this is pretty stunning. This has actually raised a lot of eyebrows. This is from Akari and Daniel, who are at Hopkins. They took a look at all the literature out there, and then in looking at the various statistics and pulling data you can see from the CDC and others, that they estimate that medical error is now the third leading cause of death. Now, I don't care if it's third or tenth, it's too many. Uh, I think that's the issue. And so the question is, what's going on here you know, that's leading to this? And one of those things relates to this is diagnostic and therapeutic errors um, you know, that, again, happen outside the procedural suites. And so I think this is kind of stunning um, that you know, we, we really need to attend to this. And our educational programs are important for that. So with that backdrop, how can Compsia-based medical education help us? Well. As I said before, we began to recognize that there were problems within the system. We may not be attending to all the competencies necessary for 21st century practice. So I really um, find this to be an important article written in 2010 by Julio Frank, who's now the president of Miami, uh, who's at Harvard at the time, working with an international group. This is a global group of policymakers and thought leaders about where do we need to go? Because all systems have real concerns around quality and cost and things of that nature. And what they recognized that really for 100 years, we started with the curriculum, if, if you had one, as John said, and then we wrote some educational objectives and then we might do some assessment around that. How many people have written educational objectives? Okay, how many people actually use them, right? They're just a task. Oh, thank you, I, I saw one hand go up, that's fantastic. Um, that's progress. Um, and then most of our assessment was around what? Knowledge, take a test. Right, there might be some observation. I think surgery has an advantage because at least you're with them in the operating room, maybe too much, but at least you know you have some observation. You can tell you medicine, you know, observation is just incredibly rare. I was observed once, by the way, in my entire internship uh, back in the days of the Giants when we were every third. 
Um, and it was actually done by a third year resident at 1 a.m. in the morning. And I had no idea he was actually doing a formal assessment of me. He just turned it in and I found out six months later that, that, that I needed what, had what I needed. Kind of fascinating. What well, Frank start, uh, really highlights, I think this is important for us, is we need to start with the health uh, and healthcare needs of our populations and systems. You know, what is it that we need today? And John alluded to the fact that there is changing nature of the surgical conditions. What we operated on 30 years ago, we, we don't today, right? So you know, all the ulcer surgery that you used to do, I'm not a surgeon, I'm an internist, but we don't do much of that today for lots of reasons. Um, thankfully, some guy in Australia swallowed some, at that time, helicobacter pylori, and we figured out what caused ulcers. But you know, there's a lot of these changes, and the competencies and outcomes need to flow from those needs. And the last thing we should be doing is curriculum and assessment you know, that flow from those outcomes and competencies we're interested in. Now, the only thing I don't like about this slide is I often say is that curriculum and assessment look separate. They shouldn't be. They should be integrated and entwined. They're really one and the same, right? Assessment drives learning, but learning should also drive the right kind of assessment. So what are the outcomes? So I think for us in the States, the triple aim, I think, is a really good framework to use. Uh, the health of a population, the per capita cost, and then the experience of care as determined by the six Institute of Medicine aims from Cross and Quality Chasm Report. The sobering reality is when you look um, at international comparisons consistently over the last decade, we're usually last uh, in a number of areas. In fact, we've even seen some regression in some areas, like um, maternal mortality during childbirth. I think it's actually gotten worse in the United States. Think about what I just said. The rate of dying in childbirth has gone up in the United States. Stunning. Right, so there, there are issues that we're gonna have to really attend to. What are the drivers then for a competency-based model? Well, you've already heard um, from John, concern about the quality and safety problems, but also the concerns about an uneven product, that too many of our trainees graduate with deficiencies in order to really enter independent practice or unsupervised practice. And then I showed you some of these gaps. There's been, a, I could have shown you a boatload of, of reports about where those gaps are, but I think that list from Jay Cross is pretty helpful. And then we really need to think about improving outcomes, both educationally and clinically, as something that's intertwined. We too often think this education is something we do over here, and then, oh, here's this clinical work, we've got to do a service. They should be one and the same. And I'll show you some data that if we think in that term, we might actually get better outcomes for everybody, including our patients, which is important. I think our training models are inflexible. Uh, in medicine, we have what I call the pluripotential stem cell model. Everybody has to come out as a stem cell. Does that really still make sense? I'm not sure. Um, and I think we have to really think that through. You know, what's the purpose? And then cost of training has become, I think, quite uh, concerning, including debt, which I don't have to tell you has become a real issue. So CBME um, has kind of risen to try to address, and one of its big drivers is to attend to some of these other things. And this is a definition from Jason Frank and colleagues about what it looks like in today's world. Um, it's an approach to preparing physicians for practice that is fundamentally oriented to outcome abilities and organized around competencies derived from an analysis of societal and patient needs. It de-emphasizes time-based training and promises a greater accountability, flexibility, and learner status. Right? Time becomes a resource, not the intervention. How do we use time well so that you can have residents move into that kind of autonomy Right, effectively, this is where I think assessment and good curriculum can really help. And when we think about it in the lens of a program, this is known as the Kirkpatrick model, which has been translated into healthcare. What we're really trying to do is make sure that we prepare people for practice, right? Those changes in professional practice so that they're ready. Competencies provide the framework to do that. And they also have added other stuff that we know is important. And the patient outcomes, our framework there is the triple A. And we want to make sure that we bring these two together. So, as I said, competencies really provide the framework for educational outcomes. They really describe the abilities of the individual. And, and during that time of quality concerns and public needs and concerns about communication and other aspects, the competencies were developed. The first was CanMeds approved in 1994, I'm sorry, 95, but the ACGME ABMS general competencies, although approved in February of 1999, the very first meeting at work began in 1994. So it's hard to believe. You know, we go back, we look, and we've been on this journey for a while, and it's definitely been difficult. But I think it's been helpful for us to begin to look at some of the other stuff. 
And so this is just one way to look at professional self-regulation kind of um, through an assessment lens. John, Stan and I work on the right-hand side, we're obviously in accreditation, or even analysis is the program. Then you have the certification boards and the various credentialing entities, and they are kind of the public-facing entities for the self-regulation, and the public is our primary constituency. Right, that's who we're supposed to you know, represent through our work, and in our case, it's a peer review process. The people working in the RCs, they're you. you know, they're your peers who are working to make good decisions to help drive improvement. But here's the bottom line. You know, the action and the most important action occurs inside that box. That's the institution and the program. We're only as good as what you do. That's, that's the bottom line. And here's the sobering reality. If somebody comes out insufficiently prepared, worse yet, cannot get certified, anybody want to guess who they tend to care for? They take care of the poor, because that's where they can get a job. So the irony is our self-regulatory system can actually exacerbate disparities. And so that's why it's so important that we make a judgment, and judgment matters. Judgment's important. There's no magic bullet, as John said. You need faculty really working through this, you know, make sure that when people come out, they're really ready. And if we don't have curriculum and good assessment, as John points out, then you get people coming out with deficiencies and everybody loses. Um, and it also undermines, you know, the professional self-regulatory processes if we keep putting people out in the system that just aren't ready. And then within the program, those feedback loops, FB and the green boxes there, is critical. Here's the other point I want to leave with in the slide. We really need to look at our residents and fellows as active agents. And I'll come back to this in a moment. They really just can't be passive recipients of assessment data. They need to be active agents, and they need to be driving some of their own assessment. And when we meet with residents, that's a foreign concept to most of them. Most of them feel like they got to wait for the assessment to come in instead of going out and getting it. And I think we really got to rethink that model and empower them. So say, like, well, listen, I'd really like to do that operation without you. Um, I think I'm ready, and then the faculty are like, you know what, I think you are, and then call me if you need me, right? So this is where I think faculty come in, and I'm going to make slight uh, distinctions between supervision versus coaching, because I think there, there are some differences there. But there's no question that you need to directly observe and provide feedback and coaching in order to develop expertise and mastery. The literature is actually quite robust. One of my favorite systematic reviews is from Hattie and Timberley, where they looked across the whole continuum from basically grade school all the way up into you know, practicing professionals. And they say one of the most import important and impactful interventions is feedback. All right, Getting feedback is one of those big drivers of how people get better. And there's no question that supervision is needed. But as John pointed out, it's kind of the appropriate supervision, so just kind of highlighting that again. But I do think that um, this is where John and I might diverge just a hair. Um, I do think that the, the North Star needs to be the patient outcome. I think for too long we've looked at MD performance and then we try to adjust the way the patient. I actually think we can get a twofer out of this and say, did the patient really get what they needed and how much of the trainee, you know, basically contribute to that in the context of these other factors that John alluded to, which I think are really important. You know, we can't put trainees into a lousy system and expect them to function well. If you have poor systems, poorly functioning microsystems, for example, like the operating theater or the clinic, there's poor teamwork going on, the idea that you can expect them to fill the gap there is, is just not fair. Um, but I think when we start with like, did the patient get what they needed then and work back, that actually helps us decide what kind of supervision is needed. And so this is another way that we think about in our direct observation work. This is an article from Jen Kogan where you say, you know, when you're directly observing an encounter, um, we say, did the patient get safe, effective patient-centered care that day? And how much did the trainee actually contribute to that outcome? And if it was that the trainee's performance was really at a high level, guess what? I don't need to be in the room. I can adjust my level of supervision to a more appropriate level and let them develop the autonomy. And obviously, all of this occurs in context. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. You have to be in a functioning you know, system. Unfortunately for us in medicine, many of our outpatient clinics, for example, are very dysfunctional. Right? They're not highly functioning systems. And so residents spend too much of their time doing workarounds instead of really learning these skills. 
Do clinical skills matter? Well, I showed you the error report. Yeah, they really do. Um, and I hope we don't lose sight of these. Uh, how many people have heard the adage, you know, you can make the diagnosis 80% of the time from a history? Some of you. How many people think your faculty just made that up? Does it sound good, the 80-20 rule? Turns out there's several studies that have shown one in kind of a pre and post technology era, and that's exactly what they found. Um, that still matters. It's also important to avoid unnecessary testing. We also know that when you do it poorly, you're more likely to make a diagnostic error. It's the Geiger principle garbage in, garbage out. You don't take good information, you're not going to make a good diagnosis. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think we're still learning. So the research is kind of early. Um, there's certainly an, an interest in using it. I, I think there's been some interesting work, for example, in dermatology, where it appears to hold up pretty well because of the visual image, and you can get a pretty good um, view. As you know, they now have tele-ICUs, um, and if they're managed well from afar, they have been found to really enhance quality, particularly for these rural, small hospitals that normally wouldn't be able to care for the patient quite as effectively, and then who are at great risk during transfer. There's actually some experiments going on now with residents. So we're in conversation about whether or not emergency medicine residents in Nebraska can actually be supervised through telemedicine and seeing what that might look like so they can get some more experience out in a more kind of community-based world. They'll have a, a board-certified emergency medicine doc and available to them, but could they actually get tele-precepting and supervision? So stay tuned. I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. Um, the other thing is patient-centered care actually matters. That's why I said this other stuff is so important. There's been multiple studies now over the last 30 years that have shown that these, this is what happens when patients see health providers with um, you know, really effective communication and patient-centered skills, all the way down to improved outcomes, decreased costs, improved well-being, more likely to adhere to treatment plans. So this isn't just icing on the cake. These are things that we really need to be teaching all of our residents to do well because excuse me, they have real impact. Uh, and particularly in those areas where we know that patients may want certain therapies that really aren't in their best interest, kind of choosing wisely type stuff. This is the kind of skills you need to deal with that. And this is just a nice article from Wendy Levinson showing the link between kind of teaching all the way out to the health outcomes that have been demonstrated when you have uh, physicians and other healthcare professionals really use communication skills quite well. And the nice thing is we actually have some very nice tools. How many people are aware of OncoTalk and VitalTalk? So there's a nice little tool for you. This is a wonderful site that you can use to learn how to break bad news, have end of life discussions, those sorts of things. VitalTalk is an app for your cell phone. And you can just look it up and it has all kinds of little tips on it that you can use on a regular basis. It'd be great for your residents to have, you know, just to look at all these different potential communication scenarios they might have to do. So just one example. Anybody know who this is? Yeah, what, what is she famous for? Got the first 10 at the Olympics. Who was her coach? Bella Caroli. Yeah, exactly. So imagine the following scenario. So um, Nadia and Bella are sitting in the preceptor room at the gym, and they're planning the day's activity, and Bella goes to Nadia like, you know what, Nadia, I want you to go down the hall to the, you know, the gym where the uneven bars are, and why don't you do a couple triple flips, I'd like you to nail a few landings, maybe do a few kind of, you know, giant swings, and then uh, come back and tell me how it went. We would recognize that as crazy, right? Bella's going to be in the room looking. That's why direct observation is so important. But what I just described to you is actually pretty common. That's most of the internal medicine training. I'm not quite sure what happens in surgical clinics. We have people come back and tell us what happened in the room. No idea if it actually went well. George Engel in the 70s likened that to sending somebody in to play a musical instrument and then coming out and telling you how it sounded and then judging them how well they played the instrument. We would recognize that as kind of crazy. And, and so I totally agree with John on the need to calibrate supervision, but we can't forget the coaching aspect of this. Coaching matters. And even people are getting good can still benefit from coaching. And so then it becomes an issue of What's the attendee's behavior in the room? And we haven't probably spent enough time helping faculty to understand that, listen, if you become the helicopter surgeon or the helicopter internist, you're not helping your individual, but you can still coach, and there's ways to do that. Do we have evidence for that? Well, one uh, body of work is by Anders Ericsson, and others is this concept of deliberate practice, where you constantly work to refine things. 
um, and you move you know, toward expert performance. And this is a slide that Andrews was kind of let me use. And as he points out, you, you gotta have professional coaches to do this. There's just, you know, to get the expertise, it's critical. How many people have read Atul Gawande's Personal Best from The New Yorker? I really like that article, and as many of you uh, who read it, you know, know, he invited a mentor to come in and watch him in the operating room, and it wasn't about supervision, it was about getting better. And most of the stuff that that mentor talked about were really very important refinements, like where he's holding his elbow, how he's standing around the head of the operating table. And he said that one 20-minute discussion gave him more to think on than he had in the last five years. He had no outside ears and eyes, was the quote from the article. And so I think we have to you know, think about the supervision, but also the coaching aspect. And this is what we don't want to have happen. And I worry that we are seeing this, that we don't give them enough coaching and help them move toward expertise through that graded responsibility. And then Andrews calls this arrested development. They plateau, right? They just don't keep getting better because they don't get pushed. They don't get that kind of coaching. And then I think as we move forward for better outcomes, we have to think about the competencies within the system. So not just a healthcare professional, but we have to work with our patients and systems to help them get better. And that's the other stuff that's very difficult. We need to be integrated. So our residents can't work in dysfunctional systems. They just can't. That also will retard their progress. Um, and so I think working with patients and our learners using this concept of co-creation and co-production I think is really helpful. This is a quote from Paul Batalda in a recent symposium that Stan and I attended. Um, I think this is a really useful model for us to think about in education. But the co-creation, co-production of healthcare services is the interdependent work of users and professionals to design, create, develop, deliver, assess, and improve the relationships and actions that contribute to the health of individuals and populations. I think the key word in there is relationships. <clears throat> I think that has also, I agree with John, We've lost that as faculty have gotten not only busier, they've also sometimes not spent as much time in the space, uh, in the clinical space. This is just a model for co-production of healthcare um, where you know we have the patients and professionals working together you know, through civil discourse, something that's kind of in short supply um, these days, um, as well as co-planning and co-execution of care. And the, and the goal is good health for all. Well, I think you can stick learners in there and it's the same thing. I see this as a very symbiotic integrated process. How can we co-produce with our learners to help them really achieve expertise? You know, by giving that, that graded responsibility, giving them the right feedback and coaching, because without it, it's not gonna happen. And then activating them to co-produce and co-create much of their learning and assessment. As I said, where they train matters. We have a growing body of work now that shows that where you train and how well the institution performs matters. David Ash has done some very interesting work looking at the rate of major obstetrical complications among practicing physicians and how it related to where they train. And he found a direct correlation between their rate of complications in practice and the rate of complications at the institution where they train. And the relative risk difference from the top to bottom quinto is 32%. Here's the other scary thing about that data that he's looked at. That effect appears to last for as long as 19 years. Good news is, on average, each quintile got better, but the bottom quintile never completely catches up. Here's the other part that was kind of scary. He then took a look to see what was the, um, the most important associations relative to practice performance. And so things like what was their volume in practice, how long they'd been in practice, those sorts of things. And then their initial kind of where they trained and where they came from, guess what? It was where they came from that accounted for the largest portion of variance in their practice. More than the volume they did in practice and more than the length of time they'd actually been out of practice. And so that launch point that we put people on, again, getting to John's point, matters. Matters a lot. And then Chen and Sirovich did similar studies looking at medicine and family medicine around cost and conservative practice. You can see same pattern there. If you train in a high cost environment, guess what? You're a high cost provider, even if you move to a low cost region. And then this one I think is important for surgery. Um, although not quite as robust as the ASH findings, Bansom colleagues last October published a similar sort of pattern looking at surgical complications related to where they train in the institutional related complications. So, very important aspect. This is some just quick data from Clear. I won't spend too much time on it, but 
as I said, that other stuff matters. It's important. The system needs it. We're still not giving our residents sufficient amount of experience. This is one of the survey questions from the clear. You can see that many residents just didn't have much of an opportunity. Only 60, only 17 and a half percent said that they had that experience. So I'm going to stop there and turn over to Stan, who's going to talk to you about in more detail around with how the milestones playing into this kind of overarching system. Okay, thanks.